thing back I got a, something I want to tell you about that song for a song that he just sang and that first song that he sang was talking about if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and so when we think about that, the words of that, you know that in the book of Acts, it says they were first called Christians at Antioch. And now they're being called Christians. But it was a derogatory statement because they were so in tune with Jesus, they wanted to be just like Jesus. And so they named them Christians. And that's how we got our name. It is first called Christians at Antioch. And the next part of that, that song, it says that when he, when he hears this, he'll hear from heaven. Think about that. You ever looked up at the sky and all the stars? And how far away is heaven? Oh. It's got to be a long ways away. So, remember when John says, God took me up to the third heaven. Wow, that's way up there. So as he sang that song about, I will hear from heaven and answer your prayers. He's way up there. He says, he's at the right hand of God and he's going to hear our prayers. He's going to answer them. Well, what a God we have from way up there. He can hear my prayers. <laughs> so, anyway, whenever we ask him to forgive us or to come into our heart, and he hears us immediately, even from heaven. So, and one day he's going to come back and take us to be with him. So, um, Martha's going to read the scripture for us this morning. And you go ahead. Yeah. Oh, that mic over there, I guess. Oh, what? I think I can do that. Maybe you can hold it for me. So this is Acts 16. Hello. Hello. <laughs> uh, so Acts 16, starting at verse 16. It's not on. Okay. 
Can you guys hear me okay? I can hear you. Kind of. <laughs> um, so it came to pass, as we went to prayer, a certain maid, possessed with a spirit of divination, met us, who brought her masters much gain by soothsaying. Let me start over. Okay. It came to pass, as we went to prayer, a certain maid went, excuse me, possessed with a spirit of divination, met us, who brought her masters much gain by soothsaying. Okay. She could see the future. The same followed Paul and us and cried, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, who show us the way of salvation. And this did she many days, but Paul, being rude, turned and said to the Spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he it came out the same hour. When her master saw that the hope of their gains was gone, they called Paul and Silas and drew them into the marketplace unto the rulers, and brought them to the magistrates, saying, These men being Jews do exceedingly trouble our city, and teach customs which are not lawful for us to receive, neither to observe being Romans. And the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates tore off their clothes and commanded to beat them. And then they laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely. Who, having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stocks. So it must have been like the dungeon, right? And at midnight, wow, here comes. Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises to God. And the prisoners heard them. They're in the dungeon and they're singing praises to God. And they're in the stocks and bonds and stocks. Suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's bands were loosed. This really happened. Yes. And the keeper of the prison, awakened out of his sleep and seeing the prison doors open, drew out his sword and would have killed himself supposing that the prisoners had all fled. But Paul cried out with a loud voice, saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. Then he called for a light and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in thy house. And they spoke to him the word of the Lord and to all that were in his house. Then he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes and was baptized, he and all of his, immediately. And when he had brought them into his house, he set food before them and rejoiced, believing in God with all his house. Amazing. And when it was day, the magistrates sent the sergeants, saying, Let those men go. And the keeper of the prison told this, saying to Paul, The magistrates have sent to let you go. Now, therefore, be part and go in peace. But Paul said to them, They have beaten us openly, uncondemned, being Romans, and have cast us into prison. And now they thrust us out privately, nay, verily, but let them come themselves and fetch us out. And the sergeants told these words to the magistrates, and they feared when they heard that they were Romans. And they came and besought them and brought them out and desired them to depart out of the city. And they went out of the prison and entered into the house of Lydia. And when they had seen the brethren, they comforted them and departed. Thank you, Martha, for Welcome. reading that. Yes, sir. So uh, we're going to have, they've already did a little bit of flagging, but I want them to do some more. And uh, one of the things that we need to listen as she was reading that passage of Scripture, and our study is on how great our God is anyway, and it's to know his nature. What is the nature of God? And one of the natures of God is his love and he cares for us. But he also is in control. 
So when we think about control, think about what Martha just read. Here these guys was in prison and they was in the stocks. They had their feet shackled up and they couldn't move. Can you just imagine sitting in there and they couldn't move, couldn't go to the bathroom, they couldn't go nowhere. They just locked up and been it was a big earthquake. Why would an earthquake happen just at that very precise time? Because God brought it. And he turned all and opened all the doors and let all the people out. And boy, this one of the things about when a guard is in charge of some people and they get loose or escape, then they have to die. That's one of the things that happened. So that's why this jailer, after the doors opened and he saw the people, and he got the sword out and he was gonna kill himself because he knew he was gonna die anyway. So then what happened is they just disappeared right out of the, the jail. When the guys come back, they went to check on them and the doors was all locked. See, when Jesus come back after he was raised again the third day and he went to see the disciples and they was in a room that was locked up and he just appeared into them. But one of the things that we need to think about with that, he says, when he comes back, to take us to be with him, our bodies are made, be made like into his glorious body. So can you think about just walking through a wall and not, <laughs> yeah, we can't comprehend that kind of thinking right now, but it's gonna happen. Our bodies are being made like into his glorious body. He just walked right through there, talked to the disciples in the locked up room. And now these uh, prisoners, they just walked right out of the, the jail and it was still locked. So that's the kind of a God that our God is. And that's why we want to study today about the nature of God and all that he does and all the power that he has and that he really is love. So let's put, uh, let's go ahead and do some more flag and Do you know another worship song? Sure. Okay.
and Jesus taught lots of things in parables. Well, do we know what a parable is? I don't. Okay, a parable is an earthly story where we can understand the perfect thing with the spiritual meaning. A lot of times people will hear the earthly story, but they won't connect it up with the spiritual meaning of it. Jesus always had a spiritual meaning in this parable that he would tell. But he wouldn't tell them what it was sometimes. He'd tell the disciples sometimes what the spiritual meaning of it was. So what I want to do is I want to tell you a, a parable today. And then I'm going to share with you what the spiritual meaning of it is. So here was this guy. He was a kind of a crook. And he was watching this house. And he kind of watched it for a couple of days. And he saw the people was gone. So, you know, oh, this is a good place to rob that place. Nobody's home. So he broke in and got in there. And... He started walking down the hall, it was kind of dark, and heard this voice say, Jesus is watching you. And he stopped, looked around, and then he walked a little further, and the voice said again, Jesus is watching you. And boy, he didn't know what to think, and he started looking around, and he saw this cage had a parrot in it. <laughs> And he said, asked that parrot, he said, did you say that? He says, yes, I did. And Jesus is watching you. And the guy says, well, what's your name? He said, my name is Moses. And so uh, the guy says, Moses, that's a dumb name for a bird. And so he says, yeah, but my master made all of us animals Bible names. So he says, You see that great big Rottweiler over there? <laughs> His name's Jesus. Oh. So anyway, he says, He's watching you. And so then the thing was, is, yeah, the old Rottweiler jumped on him and chewed him up. He made a decision. He wouldn't go to rob no more houses. But the spiritual meaning of that is, God says, I'm watching you. I know everything that you do. I know your thoughts even before you think them. So he says, Jesus is watching us all the time. We gotta be careful what we say, how we act what we do. Our nature sometimes is, is an evil nature, and we're going to study and go some, through some verses about God's nature, but we want to remember that Jesus is watching you. You have to be careful. He really is. Okay? Of course, this big old Rottweiler just ain't a believer out of that guy. <laughs> so, I'm going to take uh, this uh, first verse here and about God is love. So we're studying about the knowing God by his nature. And his nature really is love. So we're going to look at uh, John 4, 7 and 8. And I want to read several different passages to you that will help us to understand that God's nature is everywhere. So it says, this is verses 7 and 8. Are you at John 4? Yes, this is John 4. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. So that verse is pretty plain about it. God is love. And if we know him, we're going to love too. And so, next verse says, 
He who does not love does not know God. So if we cannot have love in our heart for people and situations, we probably don't know God. But he wants us to know him through his nature and his, first off, his love is nature. And the next one is, uh, God is a light. And uh, 1 John 1, 5. Think about God being the light. Oops. This is the message which we have heard from him and declare unto you. So God has let us know that this message that we hear now is from him. And we, he declares it unto us that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. So God will always be honest and open and just with us. And we, he will never lie to us or pull the wool over our eyes or say something that's not really true. He is the light, and that's truth. Everything is truth through him. So then number three is, uh, God is a consuming fire. Sometimes we have to stop and think about what fire does. First thing that fire does is it purifies us. So God wants to purify our lives. So he takes fire to purify it through the Holy Spirit. And he purifies our life. So he wants us to be pure and holy. And the second thing that fire represents is it consumes. So he wants to consume our old nature and the old nature that we're born with, he wants to consume that. So it's no more. He wants to give us a new nature. And that nature is God's nature. He wants to give that to us. So it's a consuming fire. And Hebrews 12, 29 tells us that. For our God is a consuming fire. That's just what he says. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. And God is a consuming fire. Remember that fire purifies. He wants to purify our lives. As scripture says that when we receive Christ as our Savior, He sends the Holy Spirit to be with us. Not only to be with us, to be in us. Remember in the Old Testament, God would send the Holy Spirit to men and women and give them power to do what God wanted them to do. But now after we're saved, after Jesus came, he says, I will give you the Holy Spirit and he will not just be with you, he will be inside of you, and he'll live inside of you. Amen. That's one of the reasons that we need to be purified. We can't live in an unholy place and have the Holy Spirit living in there. And he wants to consume us with his nature. The next thing is, God is spirit, John 4, 24. And as we think about spirit and John, it says that he is spirit. So 
So John 5, 24 to 30. It says, most assuredly I say unto you, he who hears my word and receives in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death unto life. And verse 30 says, I can of myself do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is righteous because I do not seek my own, but the will of him of the Father who sent me. So really Jesus through the Holy Spirit is saying that he doesn't do anything in his own. He only does what the Father tells him to do. And so he wants us to know that uh, he is there. Those who worship him, he says, must worship him in spirit and in truth. So when we pray to God, I can't see God, but I know he's there because he's given me the Holy Spirit to live inside of me. Remember in the Old Testament, when they, they would give him the Holy Spirit to do certain things, then if they disobeyed or they didn't do what was right, he would remove the Holy Spirit from them. So they didn't have the Holy Spirit anymore, but not so with us. He says, I will give you the Holy Spirit and he will live in you forever and ever. So we have the Holy Spirit living within us and he'll never take it away. So number five is uh, the attributes of God. The attributes of God reveal his nature. And his Holy Spirit Uh, he is the judge, so he has all authority, and he is the judge. And we don't like to think about the judge, because when a person does something wrong, the sheriff comes and gets him, he takes him before the judge, and the judge makes a decision about what's going to happen to him. We need to remember that there is a time when we will be judged, not for our sins, that is, those who have believed in Christ will never be judged for our sins. But he says there's going to be rewards given to all of those who obey him. And he wants us to obey him and to be what he wants us to be. So it's a So God has all, as a crime, all power to God. So all power is ascribed to God. And he is omnipotent. So let's look at Revelation 14.6. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, and as the sound of many waters, and as the sound of a mighty thunderings, saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord God is omnipotent, and he reigns. So when we think about his nature, we have to remember that he reigns over everything. Just like when we were talking about the jail, the earthquake that happened and the doors of the jail, and the guys just walked out and Jesus came and walked right through the 
the door into where they was. He has all power and all authority, and he can do anything. So when we look at the nature of God, we can't limit him to anything. He can do everything. And when we look at the world and what he's made, all the galaxies that is up there, and all the places that he's made, we look around and we have this earth and all that he's made here. And one of the things that he's done and I was talking about just the other day, he says, when that Solomon, see Solomon was a great king and he had great riches and he could wear anything or buy anything he wanted. And God says, Solomon, in all his glory, was not arrayed like one of these little flowers that I've made. God's made each one of these little flowers, and they're all precious to him. And he's given to us so that we can enjoy all the things that he's, he's given to us. I just wanted to bring this into view because we need to see it as, as truth. It says, there's, only, there's some things that God cannot do. We've been talking about all the things that He can do. And His, his power and His omnipotence, His ability to be able to do everything. But there are a couple of things He can't do. So we need to know what they are. He cannot lie. God will never lie. So he'll never lie to me or to you. He'll always tell us what the truth is. If he sees sin in our heart, he'll reveal it to us. If he sees something that pleases him, he'll reveal that to us. But he always tells us the truth. He cannot lie. And then, he cannot deny himself. As we think about God and all of who He is, He cannot deny Himself. He who is, is who He is. And like He told Moses, He says, I am who I am. And it will never change. So He cannot deny Himself. And He cannot lie. Is there is a name in God's, there is no one in God's likeness. In other words, we went through several things about how God is, his omnipotence and his power and his glory. And the scripture tells us in Isaiah 40, verses 28 to 30, he's like no other. No one can ever be compared to him. There is no name in heaven given among men or why we must be saved except in Jesus Christ. So when we think about salvation and how God has promised to us, he would forgive us our sins. And he says in 1 Corinthians 15, he says, that Christ died on the cross to pay the penalty for your sins and my sins. He died on the cross. And he was buried in a rich man's tomb. And then on the third day, he rose again. As the scripture says. So when we study the scriptures, that's the gospel in a nutshell. Christ died, he was buried, and he rose again the third day. And if we believe in three things, we can tell God that I do believe in you, and I receive your sin. I need someone who helps me. Jesus doesn't need anyone. 
sometimes we get the idea that we want something and we pray about it for a long time and nothing is happening so what we want to do is kind of help God out and make it happen just like they were in Abraham and Sarah they waited and waited and God told them he promised them a son and his seed would be more than the sand on the sea here they was he was over 100 years old and she was almost 100 and they still didn't have a baby so they thought they'd help God out that's what they did so Sarah told her take my handmaid and have a child with her and then we'll have a child and we can't help God out he doesn't need our help. So we've got to be patient and wait on him. Then the heavens do testify of God's nature. You can't look up into the heaven at night and not see the wonder and the glory of what God has done. If we put Christ first, then we'll know the nature of God. Because Christ says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Because I and the Father are one. So he wants us to see that all things come through Jesus and without him nothing was made that was made. And he wants us to take our lives and turn it over to him and say, Lord, I've heard this morning about your nature and all that you are. And I just want to trust you to be my Lord and my God. And I'll put my faith and my trust in you because I believe that you died on the cross to save me from my sin. And you was buried. And then that you rose again the third day. And that you are coming back again to take me to be with you. So Father, we just want to thank you for this lesson today on God's nature. Would you just touch our hearts with it and help us to know how wonderful, powerful, and wonderful you are. And we'll just continue to give you the praise and the honor and the glory. For it's in Jesus' precious name that I pray. Amen. So thank each of you for coming today and listening to God's word. He's, he's such a wonderful God and such a big God. We can't begin to understand everything about him. But he wants us to understand things. And that's why he says, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed rightly dividing the word of truth. And that's what we need to do is to continue to study God's word so that we'll know the truth and the truth will set us free. Thank you for coming. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Jim.